I would like to start today with a story. A story of my youth. <laughs> um, I was about 19 years old and um, I went to visit uh, my sister's godfather. He's like my uncle. And um, somehow, I don't know how it happened, it kept, we started talking about running and racing. And he said to me, he's going to race me. And I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure you want to race? And he's like, yeah. And he was fast in his day. He was very fast in his day, won loads of competitions and all of this kind of stuff. And I was very, very humble about it, but I was quietly sure that he was never going to beat me simply because I was fast and I'd been, I, I, at that time I was playing football about five times a week and I used to play centre midfield. So there's no way he's going to be able to beat me in a short distance race. None. Anyway, he was adamant he was going to race. He's like, no, oh, but I can't race you because you've got Gene on. I was like, don't worry about it. Don't worry, don't worry. I said, if I lose, I promise I won't use the Jesus as an excuse. And he's like, okay, no problem. So we race, and I let him say go. When Marks gets it, go. To, to win, but to not, like, just blow him out of the water. And um, at the end of the day, oh, I can't believe I lost to you, man. No, 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 come on. We've got to race again. We've got to race again. So I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, we've got to race again. We've got to race again. So I said, okay. So in my mind now, it's like, this time, you show him that there is no competition here. <laughs> So we race again and I, I go full pelt, give it my everything and I win. And then afterwards he is, I can see he's vexed. And the thing I love about him is very competitive in terms of it. he'll always do his best. He'll always strive to do his best. He's never going to give you anything less. And um, obviously I had 25 years on him. I had 25 years. I was very, very fit. And it's deceptive with me because I don't look fit. Like I've got a bit of a belly. I've got I don't necessarily look fit, but when I'm fit, I'm fit. And um, I won. And my auntie said, like, well, what do you expect? Do you know how old Daryl is? You're an old, you're an old man now. You're not young anymore. You're an old man. And um, he took that shame and he kind of held it. And he was like, you know what? Yeah, man, sometimes the older ones just got to, you know, let the younger generation lead and do what they're doing. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But I'm going to tell you another story about another race so i had i have um i have several siblings there's 10 of us in total and um one time the most most of us was at my dad's house and um somehow me and my me and my brother said they were gonna have a race now this is my younger brother now if you don't know my younger brother he's he's, a, he's about four years younger than me I'm a very, very close, very, very close. I actually say sometimes like he's my brother. Like the only reason why he's related to the rest of my siblings is because he's related to me and, and I'm their sibling. Like he's my brother. And um, we was having a little bit of banter and he's talking about racing. And I was like, you can't race me. He's like, what? I was like, you can't race me. <laughs> we go outside, we go outside. And I say to him, yeah, come on, let's do it. And at this time I was um, very confident, very confident up here. So I said, all right, no problem, let's race. And my older brothers are there, my dad's outside, my nieces, my nephews are outside. My older brother, on your marks, get set, go. We run. And he's like, he's keeping up with me. <laughs> then he starts to get ahead of me. So then I'm pushing now. I'm pushing to beat him. I can't. And he's a couple of, heads, a couple of yards ahead and he wins. I am livid livid like i was so angry it was i i said to him we're racing again and he's like no no, no. i said we're racing again like my eyes went big and everything like we're if we're not racing we're fighting like we're racing now so we go back to the beginning and this time i'm ready now i'm poised i'm in position i'm ready my brother calls again on your marks get set and as he says go on the gl i am off i am off I'm a couple of yards ahead. I'm doing amazing. Then I see this guy come up next to me, then proceed to go ahead of me. I was broken. Broken. And the thing is, like, it's in front of my... If you know anything about banter, like, 
Bob, you got such a good start, you know. You had, <laughs> you had such a good start. And then you come from behind and still took it. It burned me to my core. And all I could do was humble myself, even though I burned inside, simply because this is my younger brother. <sighs> even talking about it now, it still hurts. It still hurts. Anyway, let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, um, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. And I ask that um, what I'm about to share not only bless me, Lord, but would also bless others. Allow your spirit to lead my mouth now. Guide us. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, our scripture reading for today is taken from Luke 22. 31 to 32. Simon, Simon. It's never good when you get your name twice. Simon, Simon. Listen, Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that when your own faith, that, that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, will strengthen your brethren. Now, in this story, there's a person that needs to get a mention and doesn't really. And this person is Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the high priest at the time. Now, the high priest held quite a unique position of importance and power. See, he was not only a mediator and a counsellor, but they were also the judges. So they were the judge. And there was no appeal for any decision that the, that the high priest made. The priests were only... At this time, the priests were only held in restraint by the Romans. So they were not allowed to legally put someone to death. This power was held by people who ruled over them. The power to, to this is her power was held by the Romans. Yet the priesthood of that day was so corrupt. And I don't think it's necessarily fair to say corrupt and then say what I'm gonna say next. So let's, I'm gonna pull that back. The system at that time was very, very, it looked a lot like the Vatican. That's the high priest was the Pope. That's the best way for me to to put to give you a, a visual sense of how the high priest was viewed at that time. If the high priest said to you, um, you're, "You're done. You, you can't do anything over here, or you've got to go over there and do that," that was what, what had to happen. There was no question in it. There was no oh, please, no. That's it. Now, the problem was, is that the high priest was the same person, or Caiaphas, should I say, was the same person before who Jesus was presented as being a blasphemer. Now, the, now the issue is with, with this is that when Caiaphas came to, came to meet Christ, when Christ was brought before Caiaphas, he had already gone and seen Annas, his father-in-law, who was the old high priest. He come inside the, the high priest compound and he was brought to Annas first, and then from Annas he was brought to Caiaphas. Now, Caiaphas has the opportunity to hear reason or free him. But Caiaphas was already part of the plot. The plot was whatever happens, we need to find this guy, get him and kill him because he's taken our power. And that goes to show how corrupt that system was at that time. Now, the issue with that is that the, high, the position of high priest was a position ordained by God. Now, this position had holy clothes so when the when people saw the high priest, it was like a visual image of like righteousness. They had a crown. They had a turban with a crown over the top of their head. They had um, the names of Israel on their shoulders, and they had these lovely, beautiful stones, all precious stones, on their breastplate. And the thing about them that breastplate is that if light shone on it, it was like so dazzling and beautiful. Just to create a visual, so that you can kind of see what I'm saying. The high priest, what he stood for, just by looking at him, was righteousness. His garments, his clothes were designed, but God was his fashion designer. No Prada, God. <laughs> God was his designer. The clothes that he was wearing were designed specifically by God and given to Moses, and Moses made it happen. This guy's wearing holy clothes. And in a false pretense, 
when meeting Jesus and not appreciating the fact that Jesus said that he's the son of God, he tore these clothes. Instead of tearing his heart because you're meeting somebody righteous, he tore his garments. And in tearing his garments, he's literally, it's like sacrilege. It's like going for, it's like guy and toilet in a, in a sanctuary at church. It's like, it's just, you don't do it. It's just something that you just don't do. But yet still, this is something that Caiaphas has gone on to do. And it's in a false pretense of horror. It's for a show. Pappy show. <laughs> That's the reason why Caiaphas has gone through this. Now, the reason why I mentioned Caiaphas is because Caiaphas met Jesus just as Peter did. Caiaphas knew the things that Jesus was doing. And instead of trying to promote it, Caiaphas was trying to keep it down on the down low because it was affecting, it would affect him to be able to, it would affect his whole family and his whole, the whole structure of the church for him to adopt Christ's doctrine. Instead, he had to for self, self-preservation. Now, the problem with Caiaphas is that he can be very symbolic of how some of us have to be at times or have been at times. We defend our position, right or wrong, we defend our position simply because we're trying our best to uphold an established thing, something that we hold dear. That could be wrong. And the other thing is, even if we're right in our position, we should never allow pomp, arrogance, or any of these things to try and show someone on the other side, simply because we have the ability to have somebody's ear. And in doing so, we have the ability to change their hearts and their minds to see something in a different type of light. Caiaphas was on none of this. Sorry for better English to um, to follow my oh, my lovely pastor. Caius, it shouldn't be doing any of this, <laughs> but he does, and in doing so, he brings sacrilege to the very office that he's meant to be upholding. Now, as a parent, sometimes I fail a lot, like low as well, like to the point where it's like babies. I'm sorry, daddy's wrong. Caiaphas is not there. Caiaphas is not even willing to be there. Simply because Caiaphas has a cushy life. Caiaphas lives, his, his, his house is descri described as a palace where he lives. So there's like the whole compound, you've got different houses in that compound and you've got servants all around. He's living lavish. He lives a good life, sweet. He married right. That you know, he's, 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 he's oh, the old high priest is his dad, he's married all right. Yeah, Caiaphas, he's not really, he's fake. He's like, he's like a, uh, I I, how can I explain? He's like a, um, he's a fraud. He's a fraud. That's the best way to put it. But Peter, on the other hand, Peter is a different kettle of fish. Peter is a different kettle of fish because he is man Peter. He is he's arrogant, he's self-confident, he's a lot, there's a lot of things that Peter is. There's a lot of things that Peter is. The main thing that I want to describe with Peter today is how his self-confidence gets in his way. So Peter has been desired, as we read in the text, has been desired by the devil to be sifted, him and, and amongst the other disciples. He desired to be sifted as we. Now, what that means is that Peter's gonna go through trust and trials, but God has prayed for his faith. And that once his faith is restored, once his faith is restored, he will strengthen his brethren. Now, the thing about Peter, Peter hears this and Peter's like, and, and to make it clear what Peter actually said, because that, that that book in Matthew doesn't talk about it. We're going to go to Mark. And so Mark speaks about it a little bit more. So Mark 14, 27 to 31. We're going to go to Mark and we're going to hear what Peter has to say here. Bearing in mind, Jesus already said to him, Simon, Simon. But anyway, and Jesus said to them, and this is to all of the disciples, you will all become deserters for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have raised you up, but, 
after I am raised up, sorry, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Peter said to Christ, even though all become deserters, I will not. Confident in himself and his abilities. Jesus says to him, truly, I tell you, this day, this very night, in a little while, before the cock will crow three times, the cock will crow twice, and you will deny me three times. But Peter says vehemently, with passion, with gusto, even though I will die, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same as Peter. Peter's telling Jesus, Peter's telling Jesus what he's going to do. Bearing in mind that Peter knows full well who Jesus is. Bro, humble yourself. Sorry, humble yourself. Because <laughs> at the end of the day, you're being told something by Christ. Christ, face to face. It's not a prayer and you're, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. No, this is face to face. And you're saying, no, no, no. Even though you've healed my mother-in-law, even though there's a boatload of fish, even though there's countless miracles I've seen you do, even though all of these things, you've got this one wrong. You're wrong on this one because I know me better than you do. Is that so? <laughs> it's almost like what Jesus is like. Is that so? By the end of the, by the, end of the night tonight, you're going to deny me three times. Now, we know with Peter that Peter goes on to do some fantastic things. But before then, Peter hits an all-time low. The very said thing that Jesus said, that Jesus prophesied that Peter was going to do, that's exactly what he does. He denies Christ. And the thing is, he denies him to people that are insignificant to Peter. They're not insignificant in and of themselves, but they're insignificant to Peter. These are what you would... These are what you would call small, small fry. And I'm not saying that they're unimportant in, in, in and of themselves, but to Peter, that they hold no bearing. Peter's probably never going to see them again. In the small things, Peter, den Peter denies Christ. But when, it, when they come at first, as the, as the story told us, when they come at first, Peter draw his sword, cha, chop off Malchus's ear quick. You're not having my Christ. I will defend and, def and, and, and fight for him. I will stand for him. There's no way that you're going to get to him. But it's not that type of fight, Peter. Peter now don't, don't know what to do. His confidence has gone out the window. He follows, follows Jesus from afar, from a distance, and then gets called out and then denies Jesus. And this is where Peter hits an all-time low. Let's go to Luke 22, 60 to 65. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. This is his third denial. And at that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And it continues to say that he went and wept bitterly. Should have said vehemently, but he said he wept bitterly. Peter was distressed, broken. Now, I don't know about any of you, Scott, but I've been in positions before. Not like that race. That race was like one I'm willing to share. But I've been in positions before where I've been humiliated. And the thing is, the reason why I've been humiliated is because there's something that I said I'm going to do. I haven't done it. There's stuff that I've tried to do and I can't. And, I've, and I haven't really given it my all. And it hasn't been completed. Those things burn. Deep. When you get that look of disappointment or when you feel like you know that you've let someone down. And you see it in their eyes. No words. No words. You see it in their eyes. That, that feeling burns. Now, I don't know if I can get an amen from anyone. I don't know if anyone's been there. But you know that that, that, that type of pain, you don't want to feel ever again. So whatever you've got to do, you do to change that. 
And this is the beauty of Peter becoming now converted. Because the converted is Peter's still got the same body, same voice box, same organ, same everything on the exterior. But Peter's heart is in a completely different place now. Whereas before Peter would defend Christ on the big stage, now he's willing to defend Christ at every and any stage. Why? Because he is now a new person. He, his faith has held on. Now, in our lives, we're going to go through situations just the same, but we're going to be humiliated. But how are we going to allow it to, to, to how are we going to allow it to keep us? Are we, are we going to allow it to keep us down? Or are we going to be able to use it as something that we can propel and go forward with? You see, because when Peter talks about all of this suffering, Peter talks about the, the, the trials. Peter talks about the temptations that you're going to go through, that you, you're going to be purified and like gold perishes in a fire, you're going to be purified like that. But your faith is what's going to keep you unto your soul salvation. Can you do that? Like, can, can you keep that faith? Can you accept that prayer that Jesus prayed for Peter and the rest of the disciples? Can you have that same, that same spirit where I want that for me? My past is there not as a beating stick, but a driving force. Where I've been is a blessing. Why? Because I ain't never going back there again. Because I know what back there feels like. Now, I don't know if any of you ever feel like that. Where you've let yourself down in certain situations and you're like, never again. I'm not doing it. And you might even go back. And uh, you know that feeling like when the Bible talks about like your own vomit. And you realize that the, the vileness of that situation, but then you come out of that situation again and you come out maybe a little bit worse off, but you're out. This is the beauty of it. You're out. Your past is not something there to crucify you. Your past is there something to build you. The situations that have gone on before, the situations that you can't control, there's nothing you can do about them. All you can do is use those situations to drive you forward, like as hard and as fast as you can. Stand firm in your concrete belief. Knowing this is the experience I've gone through. But it's no place on where I'm going. As a matter of fact, it's going to help me get where I'm going. Why? Because I've fallen before. Get up. You've been knocked down. Get up. The situation, that a death of a loved one, the situations you can't control, get up. Your husband leaves you. Your wife leaves you. Get up. Your child might die by some freak accident. We have to get up. Why? Because we can strengthen our brethren once we're converted. There are other people that are suffering just the same as us. Don't lose that self. Looking at yourself, don't lose that. There are other people who are suffering. Yeah, and your experience is given to you for a reason. Self-harm is damaging to self. Looking at your past and allowing it to batter you back down to that same emotion, that same sad feeling, that same, that ain't helping you. That's not going to empower you. Unless that same pain, you use it to drive you. That same loved one that died, you know what? I'm going to make sure that I do them proud. I'm going to make sure. That same one that left you, you know what? He left me. No sound. It's all up here. How are you going to change the past that has happened? You see, Peter, the reason why I rate Peter so much in, in how he's gone for, in comparison to Caiaphas, because they both had the level of shame. Pa Caiaphas would have to accept his shame and change his, his mindset in order to, to receive the, the message that Christ was giving. Peter denied 
denied Christ, the person that he loved. Loved even you could even say more than his wife. He left his wife to go and serve Christ. Yet still denied him. But that same pain that he went through, he never left that. When Cornelius comes, and Cornelius, Cornelius is a guy later on in the story, for those that don't know, he's a centurion. He's like a Roman god. He comes and he bows before Peter. And Peter's like, no, 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 no. Get up, get up, get up, get up. I'm not worthy. You don't know my story yet, bro. I'm not worthy. Get up. Don't bow to me. The glory goes to God. I'm going to empower you and give you what you need because you're my brethren. Why? Because you believe. You don't even know everything here, but you believe with what you know. How can we do that for somebody else? How can we do that for somebody else? Somebody else who's suffering with the very same problem that we're suffering with, the very same issue. Now, I have to do this because of what I stand for. I'm gonna give you a story about Iron Man. <laughs> so there was a session that we had at Iron Man and um, Daniel, my brother, was putting us through some grueling exercises, as you do. And um, I remember we was near the end of the session and one of us was flagging behind and he had less reps to do and but he was pushing through his heart would not let him stop but you could see he was suffering now the fear ones finished first the other ones finished after and then as we come round, he's still going and a few of us i think if not all of us encircled him we never did his reps for him but we did his reps with him that is a word in and of itself we did his reps with him And that's the thinking about it now. It's like all the emotions are coming back. Like it was such an empowering moment because you could see he was waning. He pushed through, did his um, reps, and then went and vomited afterwards. <laughs> but the reason why I vomited is because not because he was weak, but because he pushed himself beyond what he physically could, but he was able to because of the spirit of those around him. Now, this is for me the essence of what it means not only to be an iron man but to be a christian when someone is in need or is in a position that you can help you help the best that you can why because i know, i might have known i might know somebody i might have been in that same situation i'm going to help you because i know what it's like to do that on my own i know what it's like to suffer i don't want to let's do it together let's suffer together i'll suffer with you the difference is for me i've felt it before you're, you're going through this for the first time i'll suffer with you let's do it let's do it and that's the essence that's the essence of what it means for me to be a christian not sabbath not church not other stuff no 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 it's a whole 360 degree life Math, can I borrow this? Daniel, can you borrow me that? Adrian, can you get that for me? Alan, can you help me with this? Kira, can you do that for me? Alina, can you? There's so many different things that we can do as a family, but we have to be willing to work together as a family and keep that togetherness. Like this, nothing happens. And in life, we've got enough of this. We've got enough of this. And this, even Eliah or even Ezekiel, those are my kids for those that don't know they could tear my hands apart no matter how hard i put my hands together the moment my hands are locked in not even matthew with his law and order can help can can help separate that and it's, just in case you don't know law and order are his biceps <laughs> <laughs> not even matthew can separate that why because we're together i'm going to read something for you in closing I'm going to read something for you in closing. We are in a war. And ready or not, like it or not, we will have to fight. Will we allow the warrior within to die with doubt, fear, and our past mistakes? 
or will we stand like the brave and courageous warriors we are ready to face the battle? Our enemy knows us better than any enemy simply because our enemy is ever present. Every time we see our reflection, we see them. You are your enemy. And the surrender of self is the battle. The battleground of our minds are under attack every day. And if we do not tighten our defenses and feed our souls, we may lose a battle or two. We must encourage ourselves with thoughts and words from a source higher than us. The Lord God, the Holy One of Israel says, in returning and rest will you be saved. In returning and rest will you be saved. In quietness and confidence you will find strength. Do not fear or be dismayed. Dismayed for those that don't know is like horrified, scared or shaken. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. And we must also declare within ourselves, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. So who or what should I be afraid of? We are all designed, built and created for greatness. Yet we must understand not greatness in the eyes of men, but greatness on the things which feed our soul to uplift the brokenhearted, to fight for those who are downtrodden, to be humble enough to serve in the very best ways that we can. Greatness is not found in stuff and positions of power. Greatness is to be found in service of those who are less fortunate than ourselves. They could be rich or poor, a bodybuilder or someone with an eating disorder. Our job is not to condemn or presume but to uplift, protect, and serve. However, none of this can be carried out if we do not conquer self and face our personal conflict. We are not our own. That means our thoughts have to be centered on things higher than us. In order to overcome our past, we must face it with the present truths inscribed in our minds and hearts. Weapons like no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Well known. I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. Our pasts are behind us. Yet we relive them, yet we can relive them out of habit. Our futures are written by our actions today. Yet, if we allow our yesterdays to mold us today, how unfulfilled will our tomorrows be? If we allow our past or our yesterday to mold us in the present today, how unfulfilled will our tomorrows be, our future? Face the enemy within. Deal with our horrors and our regrets of the past and let them same things that plagued us be our driving force. our driving force to accelerate our transformations to who we truly are and desire to be. There is an old Japanese proverb which says, do not speak bad of yourself for the warrior within hears your words and is lessened by them. You are the greatest asset that you have and a faith in God powered by a belief in your future allows you to become unstoppable yet you have to decide what to believe will you live today for your past or will you allow the past to empower your future yeah you choose please choose wisely